Good day again, and we're glad to be with you in another Discipleship Empowerment Word. Thank you for joining us, and I pray that as we continue on looking at the word save, this is our last night. We've been, we went through the Old Testament, then the Gospels, and now we're into the letters of the New Testament. Looking at this word saved, and again, we've been focusing on the importance of understanding that the word usually means that you're saved from something. Okay, so that's why it's when we talk about this word save, it means to rescue or to bring us from harm or to help us in our daily life or process. And so we are gathering together tonight to talk about this word and hopefully we can get a deeper understanding from the scriptures tonight. But again, remember, uh, we are being saved and delivered from or out of something and salvation is bringing us into something. And after tomorrow, we're going to talk about Savior tomorrow. Then probably Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'll talk about salvation. And so, again, please remember, saved and delivered out, and salvation brings us in to something unique and special. So when we look at the scriptures and get the testimonies from the various writers, we go to the book of Acts. And of course, the book of Acts was written by Luke. And he shares with us in Acts chapter 2 about Peter's sermon that he preached in Acts chapter 2 after the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And as he was preaching, uh, Peter then quotes Joel. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 to 32 but in that quotation and there's quite a few verses 17 18 19 20 and 21 are quoted from the book of Joel that in the last verse 21 it says and you shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved so whoever calls will be saved from their sins and from the things that they're going through they shall be saved whoever calls upon the name of the lord then a little further on just as the church is now getting established we see the growth of the church they're meeting from house to house they're uh, beginning to do things together as brothers and sisters in the lord and god is blessing them and as we look at this in verse uh 47 says praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those Who were being saved those who were being brought out? You know a lot of the people at that time were down in Jerusalem uh, For the day of Pentecost and the Pentecost festival and they would have been very religious people people who would have been following after probably Judaism, even though all of them may not be Jews, but we, because we're told they come from different countries. And it's interesting, it goes on to say here in Acts, all those who would be saved, who were being saved. So what does that mean? Well, they were in down for, to worship at the temple and to worship in a sense in the, in the, in the religion of Judaism. And now, they have been saved from that and are now coming in to the body of Christ. And so it's unique. And God was adding to his body daily. Then over in Acts 4.12, it says, here we have the words salvation and saved used together. It says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So here is, you know, they're, they're teaching, you know, there's all kinds of other gods around. There's all kinds of other temples around, all kinds of other religions around. People are preaching and making idols and, and the list goes on and on and on. And uh, people would say, well, come follow us, come follow us and you can get saved, have salvation from this and that. But the writer wanted to make clear, and it was Peter who was speaking, he says, nor is there salvation in any other. There is no salvation, which means, remember we talked that, that you would be brought into it. And salvation is a relationship with Jesus Christ. But he goes on 
It says, for there is no other name under heaven. No other name. No other religious name. Doesn't matter what other names you want to put up. There is no other name that can save you from death. That's what we're looking at here. When we look at the word, we need to understand that all these other religions are offering heaven and paradise and all kinds of other things. But what they cannot offer is to get saved from death and destruction. And to get saved from death and destruction, we got to believe. And when we believe at that moment, then we have salvation and eternal life. They walk hand in hand. They're walking like a, a parallel track. The one has to happen first, that we get saved out of something and then have salvation where we enter into that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so that's why he's saying there is no other name. People will try to tell you, oh, there is this name or this type of following and and you know he was the third prophet or the fifth prophet or the tenth prophet or whatever it may be but that might be a prophet but there is no other name that offers you the opportunity to save you out of your trespasses and sins and bring you in to a salvation with our lord jesus christ again over in acts sixteen thirty, he says the, the scripture says to us, And he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And this is the jailer. And so they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and, whom, and you will be saved, you and your household. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he mean? Okay, believe, but when you believe, you and your household will be saved. Saved from what? From destruction. Saved from death. You and your household have an opportunity to come into a place that you can be saved from those things, from those idols, from that type of destruction, and brought into salvation with God. And that's what, of course, he does, him and his household. They not only come out from, but they enter in to the wonderful walk and journey with our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we go over into Romans chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. It says, Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath uh, through him. For if we were, uh, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we have been saved by his life. So his life saves us from death. Jesus' life and what he did on the cross saves us from destruction and brings us to the place because he saves us, we can have reconciliation with God. Isn't that beautiful? What God can do for us if we would just, first of all, cry out upon him and say, Lord, save me, save me. And when he does, then we can enter into a place of salvation. In Romans 8.24, we see, for, for we were saved in this hope, but a hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? So what are they saved from here? Well, they were saved from hopelessness. You know, a lot of people live in hopelessness. They don't want to know that, what, about the afterlife, or they don't want to know about the future. They think, oh, that there's some kind of paradise or some type of thing that, you know, that they're going to get into and have 50 wives and, and all kinds of parties and all kinds of great life. That isn't what it's all about. What it's all about is to be saved. And that self, being saved comes through having a hope. And so we hope that Christ will save us. And because of that, we don't have to worry about a hopelessness we have hope that he will save us from death to life and give us his salvation, which opens the door for eternal life. And he goes on to explain, then, what must this do? And he says that in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and in verse 13. He says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe that, then you will be saved. For with the mouth, 
or for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto what? Salvation. So by our confession, now we have salvation. First of all, we believe that he will save us, and second of all, we need to confess so that we can have salvation. Then as it goes down to verse 13, he continues on and says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls shall be saved. And when you call and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth him as Lord of your life, you then will have salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that special? But sometimes people just cry out, Oh, save me, save me. But they don't, they don't go to the next step where they say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Now I ask that you would fill me and come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I want to experience the fullness of your salvation. That's what we're headed towards, the fullness of his salvation. In 1 Corinthians 18, or 1 Corinthians 1, 18, he says to us, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So what are we being saved? From foolish thinking. But for those who begin to realize that this is the truth, then we're being saved from foolishness into truth. He goes on in verse 21, For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, even though they had all this knowledge. And, and that's the problem with our age today. We have so much scientific knowledge and so much wisdom and everything at our fingertips, but it won't save us. It might help us in some of the things that are, what we're doing, but it won't save us. He says, the no God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who did what? Who believed. Who believed. So we get saved by calling out to the Lord, Lord, I believe. Just like Peter when he was sinking in the water, Lord, I believe that you can save me. As the disciples called out in the boat, when the boat was going down, they said, Lord, we believe that you can save us. Save us, O Lord. And of course, what did he do? He saved them. But there needed to be a further step of believing. You know, even then, even with the story of the boat, the testimony of the boat, he saved them from the storm. But then after that, they asked the question, what kind of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. See, they, they were saved from the storm, but they still had to get into the place of believing in the fullness of who Jesus Christ is. Because when we believe in the fullness of Christ, we have the fullness of salvation. Amen. And we're going to talk a lot about that in days to come. He says in 1 Corinthians 9.22, To the weak I became weak, as that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. See, not all were going to get saved with the message, because it goes on, it says in verse 23, Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partakers of it with you. See, he presented the gospel so that the gospel would show the people that they could get saved through Jesus Christ. But, and Paul says that I come to you even in weakness, and sometimes he said that his speech wasn't very good, his words wasn't good, and sometimes his writing wasn't good. But he does, he does it in weakness with the hope that God would give strength and honor his words so that others may come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then again, over in Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 8, he says to them, in the, to the Ephesian church, Paul does, he says, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. It's by grace of Jesus that he turns. You know, we were dead in trespasses and sin. We did deserve total damnation and destruction. But when we cried out, Jesus turned and grabbed us. And it was because of his marvelous grace that we were saved. But then it brings us to the place that as we, then he goes on and says, and raises us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. How? 
in Christ Jesus. Remember I said he saved us from and puts us into something. What does he do? He puts us into Christ Jesus. If you want an interesting Bible study, go through the book of Ephesians and circle the word in every time. You would be amazed that that tiny little word has such a theological uh, impact on the church if they would just see what it is to get saved from and to come in to the fullness of Jesus Christ and into the fullness of his spirit. Verse 8, he says again, For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. See, there was no way you could save yourself. There was no way that you could get out of the miry clay. You couldn't do it. But through faith and that of not of yourselves, not faith in yourselves. Again, you couldn't do it yourself. Even if you had all kinds of faith to believe you could do it, you still couldn't do it because you needed someone else to save you. And not only to save you, to bring you out, but if you would have faith, he would bring you in. It is a gift from God. What is the gift of God? That he brings you out and brings you in. Are you getting it yet? I'm hoping you're excited about this as much as I am. Because it is a gift of God. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 He says to the Thessalonian church, And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So what was the problem? They were in unrighteousness. They were in deception. They were perishing. And the sad part is they would not receive the love of the truth. What is the love of the truth? That Jesus Christ came and died and resurrected again so that we may have eternal life. They wouldn't accept that truth. They balked at it and they said, no, we don't want it. And he said if they would have just received his love and their truth, they might be saved, but they wouldn't receive it. So because of that, they stayed in their predicament. They could not come from where they were and come in to where God wanted them to be. Oh, thank you, Lord, for what you do. Then Paul talks to Timothy. Remember, we always talk about when we get into Timothy and Titus books, he gives us tips to the leaders. Both these books were written to the young leaders, Timothy and Titus. And he, Paul says to Timothy here in verse 15, it says, This is a faithful saying, Timothy, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners for whom I am a chief. He came into the world to save sinners. I know what that's all about. I was one of them. I wasn't quite as bad as Paul, but I was up there, a chief sinner doing all kinds of terrible things. But I cried out to Jesus Christ. I said, Lord, save me, save me. And he saved me out of that. But then he brought me into the fullness of his spirit and sealed me and empowered me with the Holy Spirit. That's where the difference comes. That's what we need to understand. He saved us from being a sinner. Then he goes on, Paul, to the, to the Timoth and telling Timothy, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See, he desires that you be saved. So what? Why? So that you can come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the truth? Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood so that you could experience salvation. That you could enter in to the salvation experience, to enter into the Holy of Holies, to enter into the kingdom of heaven, to enter into the very presence of God. But it first means that we as men and women must be saved. And we need to be saved from the things of this world, from the knowledge of this world, from the things that the world tries to bind us up. We need to be saved from that and brought over. We need to be saved from all those false religions and things that are not truthful. We need to be saved from those that don't teach and preach the word of God. Because it will become a snare to us. It will bind us, as Hebrews says. Do not get ensnared with those things. But if the thing is, if men desire to be saved and come to the knowledge and truth of who? Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. 
He says that. First of all, he says to Nicodemus, you need to get saved. In 1 John, or I'm mean, saying in John chapter 3. And then he says to Nicodemus, after you get saved, Nicodemus, you got to believe and be born again. To believe that I am the way, the truth, and the life. To believe I am the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God, and the Son of Man. You've got to believe that, Nicodemus. And if you do, you will have salvation. And so this is what Paul has been saying to them. Then he says in, in, in 1 Timothy 2.4, who desires all men to be saved? Oh, we just read that. To come into the knowledge and fullness of the Lord. Then we go over to 2 Timothy 1, nine, where he says to Timothy, who has saved us, who has saved us, and then what did he do? And called us to a holy calling, not according to our works. See, we couldn't do it on ourselves. We couldn't keep the law we couldn't it didn't come through circumcision it didn't come through all the number of things that we did it couldn't come through the works but according to what his purpose and his grace what was his purpose his purpose was to save us what is his grace his grace is to fill us are we getting it yet i i just got so excited when i was studying these thinking wow look at this truth here that he saves us out of Something with a calling. He says, come on to me, Jim. Come on to me. Whatever your name may be, come on to me, Norm. Come, come. All you are watching, come. And I know many of you have come and he saved you. But then he not only brought you from something, amen. He brought you into the fullness of his Holy Spirit and empowered you. Can I read that again? He who saved us and called us by a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. By grace have you been saved. Amen. Grace which was given to us. How? In. Here it is again. Grace given to us. How? In Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Did you see that little word in? He gave it to us in Christ Jesus. He brought us out to bring us in. Am I wearing that out? I, I'm hoping tonight when you're laying your, in your bed tonight, you're going to think, boy, that guy just hammered and hammered. It's a nail that needs to be nailed down. We need to nail it down that we've been brought out from something. He wants to bring us out so he can bring us in to the fullness of who he is. That's what his love is. That's what his desire is for us, for each one of us. Then in 3, 5, it says, not by works of righteousness, which have we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing and regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. So here again, he saved us. And then from that point, he continued to wash us and clean us up by the work of the Holy Spirit. We well, say, well, how does that all fit in? Because... We get drawn by the Lord. You know, how do people, I pray every night that God will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring people. It's the Holy Spirit who brings. It's the Holy Spirit who brings you from something to something. Unless the Holy Spirit draws you, you won't come. Unless the Holy Spirit puts a desire in your heart, it won't happen. But the Holy Spirit is the one who is drawing you and empowering you to come from so that you would see the fullness of God and that your eyes would be open and your ears would hear what the Spirit has to say. And what is the Spirit is saying? Trust in Jesus and in his power and in his authority. That's what the Spirit is saying to us. So Titus tells us that. Oh, we need to get going in Hebrews 7. 25 he says therefore he also able to save to the uttermost those who come to god through him since he always lives to make intercession for us he is interceding what is he interceding i think he's interceding and asking 
as it were, before the Father, that these people, these lost people would come. But then he's also interceding in us that he would, that we would draw closer to him. That we would not be brought, you know, so many people, they pray and they cry to God and they say, oh God, you get me out of this. I remember when I was a youth pastor, you know, young people would come up to me and say, you know, if God gets me out of this, I'll believe. If he gets me out from this, I will follow. And then God gets them out and they don't follow. You know, have you ever seen that? It amazes me what people will beg God for. Oh God, if you do this, I'll give you that. If you do this, I'll do that. If you bring me from this, I'll do that. But they don't go to the second part. And maybe they've got saved, but they don't have salvation. Uh-oh, now I'm going to get in trouble, right? No, because you can get saved out of, but you still got to come into the fullness of Jesus Christ. You need to come into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We need to come into the fullness of the Word of God. Amen? From cover to cover. Why? So that it may sanctify us and make us righteous before the presence of our God. Oh, you could get me preaching a lot here tonight. Who makes intercession. Then as we go over to Hebrews 11, 7, again, the, the hallmark of faith in 11, 7, he tells us here, he says, mm -hmm. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of the things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heirs of righteousness, which is according to what? Faith. Did he get saved because he built an ark? No, the ark was, I mean, did he get salvation because he built an ark? No, he got saved from a flood because he built the ark. But he experienced the presence of God and the faithfulness of God because, the scripture says, of faith. He had faith to believe that what God spoke to him to do. And can you imagine what kind of faith that must have taken to be able to go out in the middle of a field and begin to build a massive ark? I mean, being ridiculed and laughed at and people thinking, maybe you've lost your mind there, Noah. But he knew that God wanted to save him and his family, and he was going to have to build an ark. But he built the ark so that his family would be saved. But he came into a greater presence of God because he had faith that God would keep his promises and his word. In James 1.21 it says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and, and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. So the word will help you. If you just receive the word, it would help to save your soul. But it will not take you. I mean, it will take you in all the way. But you need to see that the word will show you that it's Jesus Christ, who is the living word. He says in James 5.15, and that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. So we can get saved from some of these things by faith and prayer. Then we go on. Got a couple more over in 1 Peter 3.20. 1 Peter 3.20. And again, he talks about Noah. He says, Who formerly was disobedient, when he, once the divine long-suffering, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved from what? Saved from water. And it goes on and talks more about that. Then again, he says in verse 18, it says, If the righteousness of one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? He's saying, you know, Unless we come to Christ, the ungodly and the sinner is not going to make it. They are already judged in their trespasses and sins. They're already going to experience. One thing that Peter says in Second Peter, that again he talks about Noah. See, there seems to be a lot about how Noah was saved out. And there's a lot of people that use these verses that God is in the last day is going to save us out of and bring us in to his kingdom.
his heavenly kingdom. And it says here in verse 2, 5, And he did not spare the ancient world. He did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. So Noah didn't just build an ark. But he also kept proclaiming the righteousness of God, and the people didn't want it. He said, "If you'd read, if you'd receive the righteousness of God, you could have salvation. If you would just trust and believe in God, you could come into this ark and be saved." But they wouldn't. They were so full of themselves and so full of pride. Oh, it is so sad. Then finally, over in Revelation twenty-one twenty-four. He says, And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the king of the earth will bring their glory and honor into it. You know, it talks about how the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth, and how we are going to be saved from the things of the darkness of this world. And we're going to be brought into, by salvation, the glorious redeeming light of Jesus Christ. You know, God wants to save us from whatever we're facing, and we've got to trust Him for that. No matter what you're facing right now, He'll save you from that. You know, saving is something that can be an everyday process. You know, something He saved you from yesterday, and there's things that you may need to be saved from today, and there probably will be things that you need to be saved from tomorrow, because we get into stuff. But one thing is we only have to come to Jesus once for salvation. When we come unto him and say, oh Lord, save us. And then we come unto him and experience the fullness of his salvation. As he brings us that place of salvation. You know, it's a beautiful place. And I thank God for it. So I hope that these three nights have encouraged you. To believe that God wants to save you from something. And he wants to bring you in to the fullness of his salvation. If you haven't experienced the fullness of Jesus Christ, call upon his name and say, Lord, save me. But not only save me, Lord, fill me. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness. We thank you for your words, for the power of your scripture. We thank you for these gems and nuggets of words that can help us to grow in our faith as disciples. And thank you, Lord, that you want to save us from those things that we struggle with. But also, Lord, you want to bring us into the fullness of your salvation. And Lord, I thank you for that, that you want to fill us and that you want to empower us. And we give you all the praise now. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. It's great to have been with you today. And just enjoy the goodness of God's word and the fullness of his grace. Amen. And just remember, we love you in Jesus. And Lord willing, we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.